September 2010, and a crowd gathers on a remote hillside in Sussex to pay their respects to Indian war heroes. Incredibly, more Indians volunteered to fight for Britain in the First World War than all the Scots, Welsh and Irish combined. And of that number, up to a third of the soldiers were Sikhs, despite making up just a fragment of India's population. The Sikhs had always been soldiers, they'd had to be soldiers, because to survive, uh, they had to fight. In this week of remembrance, this is the little-known story of the Sikhs who answered Britain's plea for help in two world wars. The contribution that Sikh airmen make during the Battle of Britain is a very key contribution. I was dragged out of the aircraft, people saying, oh, he's still alive, he's still alive. They helped save Britain from Nazi tyranny. We wanted to fight against Hitler because we wanted democracy. And laid down their own lives for this country's freedom. German regiments, uh, seeing Sikhs who were fighting against them, uh, running out of ammunition, taking out their swords and marching towards them. And we discover why the modern-day British Army is so keen to recruit young Sikhs. You know, in the Army we promote integrity, you know, courage, discipline. Let them things are part of our religion. To discover why the youngest of the world's great religions radically transformed from largely peaceful origins into a warrior brotherhood, we have to delve back 500 years. The Sikh way of life started in 1469 uh, with the birth of our first Guru, Guru Nanak Dev Ji. We have to recognize God and love God in all. That's one of the teachings of Guru Nanak Dev Ji. But by the 17th century, the serenity of the Sikh faith was under threat from India's then rulers, the Mughals. The first five gurus, the uh, first five teachers, did not bear arms. But the following five did bear arms. Mughal state executes at the beginning of the 17th century the fifth guru. And there's felt to be a need to change the nature of the community as a result of that. You have two courses, you can either bend to their will or, or stand up and, and, and be counted and actually fight against the suppression and the persecution. That fear of persecution led to the evolution of a warrior identity and with the accession of the tenth and final guru, Gobind Singh, it cemented itself as a form of pure Sikhism known as the Khalsa. The Khalsa is a group of men who are initiated into this group and have to keep on their bodies a set of symbols which have very much uh, to do with military status and military power and which mark out initiated Sikh men. As well as a commitment to remain faithful to Sikh teachings, the Khalsa vowed to take up arms to defend themselves and others against persecution. And at the end of the 17th century, Gorbin Singh proclaimed that when all other means have failed, it is righteous to draw the sword, giving rise to a concept known as Saint Soldier. A Sikh is both a Saint Soldier, like uh, in, the, in their life, that you not only uh, do you meditate and pray and show the kindness and willness to God, but you also uh, oppose oppression. During the 18th century, Sikh armies proved their fighting power with key victories and conquests in their native Punjab. But a new foe emerged in the mid-19th century as the British Empire extended east. The Sikhs had always been soldiers. They'd had to be soldiers because to survive, uh, they had to fight. They had to fight to survive. If they didn't defend their way of life, it would disappear. Um, the British, in 1848, after the Sikh Wars, um, like many of our best soldiers, uh, it all start, we start off by going to war with them. Uh, and then we, the war finishes and both sides reckon that actually the other side is really quite good chaps after all. The British view was it was much better to have the Sikhs on our side uh, than fighting against us. And so it was only a short step uh, to the British saying, look, we've been enemies in the past, uh, but actually there's more between us than divides us. Um, come and work for us. With the Punjab annexed, the British harnessed the Sikh army's power to strengthen its hold across India. 
aided by an anthropological approach to managing differences among their Indian subjects, the martial race theory. The martial race is, um, in the British conception, it's a community of people that had uh, a very kind of specific military ability uh, and they identified the Sikhs, the Gurkhas, various other races in India that they believed were martially skilled, militarily skilled and they admired these and tried to recruit them into the British Army. After the Anglo-Sikh Wars there was a specific attempt to get Sikhs into the British Army. Once they had been baptised and taken an oath to Sikhism they knew that the Sikh once in, on, on, on a battlefield he would fight till the end so uh, there was that loyalty to the banner they were fighting under. By the early 20th century, the Sikh's homeland, Punjab, was providing over half the troops used in the British Indian Army, despite Sikhs making up just 1% of the country's population. And with the onset of the First World War, Britain found it had a useful new source of war conscripts. The British Army went across to France in 1914. It took a huge number of casualties. The only army that could reinforce it, the only army that was almost as big as the British Army and was regular and properly trained and experienced was the British Indian Army. And very, very early, in, in uh, as early as September 1914, Indian troops were moving from India by sea uh, over to France, coming up and taking their place in the line on the Western Front. For many Sikhs, bravery on the battlefield was in itself an honourable act. In a letter home, a soldier fighting on the Somme wrote, It is quite impossible that I should return alive. Don't be grieved at my death, because I shall die, arms in hand, wearing the warrior's clothes. This is the most happy death that anyone can die. Well, by the sheer numbers of the Sikhs that fought, I mean, 100,000 men is, is, is a great boost to any campaign. And um, on top of it, the bravery that these Sikh uh, soldiers showed some campaigns at some battlefields, the complete regiments were exterminated because mm -hmm. they fought to the end. One particular story of a, of a, of, of a German regiment uh, seeing Sikhs who were fighting against them, uh, running out of ammunition, and all of a sudden taking out their swords and marching towards them you know, in a rage. So they actually commended this courage that, that they saw. <laughs> News of the, um, the Sikh soldiers fighting um, in the Eastern or the Western Front was covered by, by all the newspapers worldwide, French papers and American papers, uh, mainly to show their flamboyant and colourful uniforms as well and, and, and appearance, uh, but at the same time showing that the Sikh soldiers had rallied and come to fight under the banner of the British Empire. We've got some lovely images showing them marching through the streets and the local French crowds greeting them, throwing flowers. And this wasn't just because this was an oriental figure marching through the streets of Paris, but really there was gen genuine um, love and genuine affection that you know, these Sikh soldiers had come to save them. In 1916, the Germans made audio recordings of Sikh prisoners of war captured on the Western Front and only handed the tapes to the British Library earlier this year. In this harrowing recording, 24-year-old Marl Singh tells of his own tragic predicament. Sikh soldiers were deployed in the harsh European trenches, like Jermal Singh Johal's grandfather, Manta Singh. The war broke in 1914 and his regiment was sent to Europe. The conditions were very rough, I mean, uh, trenches and of course in Europe when the uh, winter comes in, you can well imagine it's snow, rain and uh, mud everywhere. This is my grandfather, Subramantha Singh. Looking at the size of the tear one, uh, it uh, makes the soldiers look at least about six inches taller than his normal height. And next to him is Captain Henderson. His senior officer, Captain Henderson, got wounded 
and he went to save him. And while he was bringing him back in the wheelbarrow, he got shot in his leg. And he was brought to hospital in Brighton. A royal palace in Brighton, although designed with Eastern pretensions, was still an unlikely setting for a military hospital to house wounded Indian soldiers. We're now approaching the music room, which is uh, one of the most popular and one of the most vividly decorated rooms in the Royal Pavilion. And like many of the rooms in this building, it was used as a hospital ward for Indian men. Now, strikingly, this room is perhaps one of the less peaceful rooms in terms of its decoration. And one can see the rather vivid snakes and the dragons that adorn the wallpaper, etc. It's a very unusual place to have a hospital. And, you know, one can't help but wonder what the wounded men felt in their beds, lying down looking up at these uh, very vivid, almost sort of martial images they saw around them. Over 4,000 injured Indian soldiers were brought to the Royal Pavilion and many were surprised by the opulence of their new surroundings. Certainly the letters we have from the Indian soldiers themselves indicate that they were very, very honoured by the fact that they were given space to actually recuperate in a, in a royal palace as they saw it, which was also augmented by the fact that King George V made two visits here in January and August 1915. The care the Sikh soldiers received in Brighton led to a strong sense of personal duty to King George V. In a letter home, one Sikh soldier wrote, May God grant long life to the generous-hearted sovereign who has deigned to think of his humblest soldiers. In the First World War, when this building was used as an Indian military hospital, this room was not used for as a kitchen at all, but it was used as an operating theatre. And there were over 70 operations conducted here that we know of. As a thank you for the manner in which the injured troops were looked after, a new gateway to the Royal Pavilion was donated by a Sikh Maharaja on behalf of the Indian people. But for Mantha Singh, there would be no recovery at the hospital and no return to his homeland. Saving the life of his captain led to the tragic loss of his own in 1915. My grandfather was only 27 years old. And of course, leaving two small kids back in India it was difficult for grandmother to bring them up. The outcome of the First World War, the early stages of it, uh, certainly without the Indian Army contribution, and of course Sikhs were a large part of that contribution, I think the war might have been very, very different. Uh, the Indian Army contingents arrived uh, during the First Battle of Ypres uh, just in time and in just enough numbers uh, to block the gaps. They certainly saved the British from what might have been an embarrassing retreat back to the Channel ports. The Sikh and Hindu soldiers who died at the Royal Pavilion were cremated at this spot, just outside Brighton, now known as the Shatri Memorial. They were all part of a death toll, which by the end of the conflict numbered over nine million lives. Certainly in the award of gallantry medals, the Sikhs were certainly overrepresented, not only in Victoria Crosses, but in other gallantry medals as well. But any Sikh soldiers who'd hoped that their loyalty during the war would be rewarded with greater autonomy back in their homeland were in for a shock. Within months of the war's end, Britain reverted Punjab back to martial law under a repressive regime, which reached its nadir in April 1919 in the Sikhs' holiest city. British military orders led to the shooting of 1,500 unarmed men, women and children at Jallianwala Bagh for taking part in a peaceful demonstration against British rule in what became known as the Amritsar Massacre. They'd fought as a voluntary force for... Uh, and a, for, for another country, for a, for a campaign which didn't affect them. And uh, this is how they were treated, so they, they, there, was, there was betrayal and they felt cheated. By the start of the Second World War, Anglo-Indian relations were increasingly fraught due to the rapidly growing independence movement, leaving many Indians facing a dilemma of loyalty. 
Nevertheless, India's Sikhs, Hindus and Muslims again answered the British distress call with over two and a half million signing up for action, the largest 